Okay, well, for those of you who are new to visiting our church or a church like this, I just wanted to explain what's about to happen. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, a prayer. It's a song in the book of Psalms, and this is a psalm that was part of Israel's worship book. They had 150 psalms or uh, songs or prayers, and this is the worship book that they used to worship God. This was hundreds of years before Jesus came, and the one in particular that I'm going to read from is uh, by a man named David, and this is one that he was praying when he was king. There's a little subscript at the top of this passage in your Bibles. That wasn't put in by the translators. That was part of the inspired text. So just a bit of introductory notes. So I'm going to read the passage and then a short prayer, and then I will teach and exhort from the scripture. So that's what we're about to do. This is what Holy Scripture says. A Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I, s I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus to Paul when he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Father, I feel my weakness this morning, and I'm sure many people in this room may feel their weakness. So Father, we, we ask for your help. Fill me with your Holy Spirit in the preaching to preach and teach with clarity and with the love that you have for your people. And help those in the listening to hear this not as the word of man, but as it is the word of God. Help them to be discerning as they listen to the teaching and the exhortation. We pray that the truth of your word would go deep into our hearts and it would shape our vision and view of you and of your son Oh, God, we ask you for the Spirit to help us in this time. Help us to concentrate, to obey the command, to love you with all of our minds. Even now, protect us from the evil one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, David was weeping as he went, barefoot and head covered. That's what we read in 2 Samuel 15, when David's son Absalom sought to kill him. Also, David's most trusted counselor, Ahithophel, had betrayed him. He was in exile from his home and his throne. This is likely the historical context of Psalm 63. David prayed this way, when he was fleeing for his life, not after, but in the wilderness. 
But David was not characterized by tears alone. Now, there are no commands in this psalm. There are no requests in this psalm. It's simply a meditation. But it's to be valued more than gold because in it we have an example for us of how to pray and how to behave in our wilderness because we all face trials of various kinds. And I'm aware that many in this room are away from their homeland. There are many points of relevance that we will feel as we look through this psalm. Above verse 1, Scripture says, A psalm of David, he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, this sermon has two parts, like a football game. I use the word football in the European way, my American friends. There are two parts to this message. The first part is quite simple. We're just going to look at David's example. That's what we're going to do. I will be teaching the meaning of verses within the psalm, not looking at every verse in detail, but looking at three main elements that we can learn from David's example. In the second part of the message, we will think through how this applies to us, and I will exhort you from this psalm. So, three things to consider here. First, David seeks God earnestly. David seeks God earnestly. Like a weary pilgrim in the wilderness, without water for many days, David thirsts for God. He's desperate, verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. He continues, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. Now, I'm sure he had desires for better circumstances, like restored relationships, like being at home again, and so on. But more than anything else, he desired God. You don't meet too many people like this, do you? He had this intense conviction that more than anything else, He needed God. But practically speaking, what does that actually look like? I mean, how do you seek someone who's invisible? Well, we're going to look at that next. This is the second observation. By the way, I said three elements in his example. The first and the third are quite brief, but we will linger on the second one longer. It requires some careful thinking here. So, point number two. David seeks God earnestly by meditating on his steadfast love. This is how he seeks God. Now, around four or five years ago, we're from Toronto in Canada. My kids were going to a public school there, and they came home and told us that the teachers were teaching meditation. But in Toronto at that time, at least, in Scarborough, where I'm from, what that meant is you should try to empty your mind. This may be a concept that you have heard. Meditation is emptying your mind. Well, that is not the Hebrew concept of meditation in the Bible. It's more like filling your mind. Listen to this helpful quote from J.I. Packer. He writes, and this will be on the screen, I believe, meditation is the activity of calling to mind, thinking over, dwelling on, and applying to oneself the various things that one knows about the works and ways, purposes, and promises of God. And this is performed in the presence of God, under the eye of God, by the help of God, as a means of communion with God. Even if you're not directly talking to the person, you know they're in the room. They're there. He's here. He's watching. We're together. And I'm thinking about him and what is recorded in the written word. Yes. We're going to see in this psalm an emphasis on David's thinking, his remembering, his meditating. 
He's thinking with his mind. He's dwelling on God. Look at verse 2. He says, so, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. Now, remember, David's not actually in the sanctuary. Where is he? He's in the wilderness. He's already told us that. He's in the wilderness. But he's remembering something like you maybe do sometimes. You remember the place where you were in the past that was pleasant times in the past when your soul was satisfied. He's remembering times when his he was satisfied in the sanctuary. Now, in David's time, they didn't have church buildings. In fact, they didn't even have the temple. It wasn't built yet. Solomon would build it. But when he says the sanctuary, he means the tabernacle that was built, this portable tent of meeting built in the time of Moses. And that was the main place at that time in history where God had ordained to meet with his people. And David experienced something of God's presence then, and he's remembering these times when he beheld, he gazed upon with the eyes of his heart, he he beheld the power and the glory of of God, not in a platonic way, like the concept of power. No, 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 no. For the Hebrews, with their scriptures, they celebrated the acts of God in real history that showed off the very muscles of God (laughs) to the honor and glory of God. They had a God who saved them from their enemies. And David, who is on the run for his life, his thinking about these times in the past of worshiping with God and his people, experiencing something of his presence as they celebrated his power. <laughs> I don't, we don't know what stories, maybe stories like God saving Noah and his family from the flood. Maybe. Maybe times like when Israel was saved from Egypt. I'm not sure, but these thoughts led David to dwell on something. Notice the flow of this prayer. He dwells on and delights on something else about God. You know, when we think about things, one thing leads to another. Look where David's thoughts go. And this is the heart of the psalm in verse 3. David prays, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. These are shocking words. You know, in my home, when I'm looking at some messy highlights on my cell phone or some NHL hockey highlights. And my kids and I, we see highlights. We get excited and we can't believe. I don't know who, those of you who follow soccer, but some of the goals that Messi's scoring for Miami these days, it's amazing. And if our little three-year-old son, if he ever catches wind and he hears us, sees us huddled around a cell phone and being amazed, you know what he does? He bursts in through and he wants to see what everyone, what we're so excited about. That's the way we should approach verse 3. What do you mean? You're on the run for your life. Your son's trying to kill you. Your most trusted right-hand man has betrayed you. You're away from your job and away from your home and away from your throne. And you're saying God's steadfast love is better than life? God's steadfast love is better than a restored relationship with your son? God's steadfast love is really better than being reconciled to Hithophil? God's steadfast love is better than getting back in your homeland? You really believe that, David? Well, what do you mean? I think we should be huddled around this verse saying, yeah, what does, what does he mean? Is he delusional? What is this? What are these ancient words? What's all the excitement about? Well, the Hebrew word is hesed. I'm imagining as I look out at you, there are many different English translations in your laps or on your phones. And the English translators have a hard time knowing what to do with this. I think the NIV just says love. I think the New Living Translation says unfailing love. The ESV says steadfast love. One commentator I was reading said, no, it's, it's, it's the loyal love. I think the CSB gets it best. They just say the faithful love. 
The reason why they're grappling with different translations here is because Hesed, it's God's covenant keeping loyal commitment to the good of people he's in a covenant relationship with. But you can't say all of that for one word. <laughs> you know what marriage is, right? The marriage covenant in sickness or in hell for rich or poor. When you're in a covenant, you're to love with unswerving commitment. You keep your commitments in the marriage covenant, even when it hurts. That's what David's thinking about the covenant faithfulness of God who always keeps his word. He always keeps his promises. That is what David is saying is better than life. Knowing that love, he's thinking about that in the wilderness. Now, for David, there were five covenants in Scripture that he could, like the banquet table, that he would feast upon. He knew that his soul would be satisfied with the fat and rich food of thinking about these things. For us who live after the time of David and after the time of the death and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, there's the new covenant that those who have faith in Jesus have entered into the new covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, knowing God as your father. That's a different covenant that David maybe just imagined and looked for and longed for, but he didn't, he didn't know that one. So he's thinking about the first five covenants. <laughs> How God always keeps his word. And he is sure, not only does he meditate on this, this leads to the third element of David's example. David is confident that God will satisfy his soul because David's a believer. David trusts in God. David is trusting that the promise that God made of a son who would come from Adam and Eve and, unver and reverse the curse of sin and death in Genesis 3, David's trusting in that seed. David believes that when that seed comes, there'll be a whole new world. The whole new world that what we saw with Noah and his family when they walked out of the ark, that's just pointing to something even better. That promise of a whole new world and the son coming from Eve who would attain that new world for people would come through Abraham. There was a promise that God would bless the nations and that the, the canopy of death and the curse of sin and death that covered the world, there would be hope of salvation because someone would come from Abraham. And that same person would have authority over sin and death. That son was promised to David. And David knew, he was amazed at that man would eventually come through his own line. David was trusting fully in God's promises that God would keep that promise and that a king would come to save God's people. So David believes that with all of his heart. And David has seen in the past how God has always kept his promises to his people. And that is the stuff that David is thinking about which makes him confident that God will satisfy his soul. Even if it means meditating more than five minutes. He, 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 is, he is earnestly seeking God. He will meditate on God's steadfast love for days. He's convinced that there is nothing else out there. I mean, he had already tried. David always wasn't like this. You know Bathsheba. Have you heard the story? Oh, something else occupied his mind that night. Oh, he knew what it was like to believe that sexual pleasure would satisfy his soul. And he even knows what it was like to pursue public honor and a good name by trying to cover up his sins. Though he, and he was guilty of the murder of Uriah. Oh, David knew what it was like to deeply long for other things. But he had learned. He had learned from his sins and mistakes, and he is sincere and earnest in this psalm. He does not want to pursue other things, nothing earthbound. What he wants most is God himself. God is the one who will satisfy 
his soul. He, he, in this psalm, he kind of sounds like uh, what we read in, in, in Psalm 73, the words of Asaph, who said, God, there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. <clears throat> Let me borrow the words of Hebrews 11.6. David is certain that God rewards those who seek him. He is going after God. And he will meditate and think on and chew on God's faithful covenant-keeping love in Scripture until his soul is satisfied. It might seem strange to you. That's what we're dealing with here in the Bible. This ain't no Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is God, and David knew God. David's chewing on this stuff. This is the example we have. So what we have found here is, let's summarize these three elements of what we've seen in what David does in the wilderness. Here's the example. David earnestly sought God, number one. He did that by meditating on God's steadfast love. Secondly, and he did so with confidence that God would satisfy his soul. That's point three. So you can imagine as we move to the exhortation what the three points of this sermon might be for you. I hope you can imagine. I'll give you a hint. The first one is to seek God earnestly. But we must be careful. We've been studying an example of praying in the Old Testament. And in applying the Old Testament can be like, uh, dri like driving in Belgrade. It's very tricky. You got to be careful. There are points of continuity and discontinuity. There are some things that resonate immediately and clearly, and some things are very different, and a number of qualifications need to be made. I don't like it when people misconstrue my words. I don't think God likes it when we mishandle his word. May God help us to be very careful here. I think the first point, it's a clear, simple, there's a clear, simple element of continuity. David sought God earnestly, and so should we. In, in John 1, 38, Jesus asked his disciples, what are you seeking? I could ask you that. You've come to church this morning. You're here, but what is it you're really seeking? What is it that I'm truly seeking? What do you long for most in your life? It's true, the proverb says, that our hearts are like deep waters. It can be hard to reach down and see. That's true, that's true, but we don't need an x-ray machine here. We need Psalm 63. Psalm 63 helps us. Think about this. What's been occupying your mind lately? What have you been meditating on and remembering on your bed in the night? What memories have you been regularly recalling to your mind? You know, what, what are these things that you've been thinking about a lot? These are windows into what you believe will satisfy your soul. These are windows into what you functionally believe. I'm not talking about your statement of faith on paper. I'm talking about our functional theology right now. In the wilderness, where we are, these are windows into the things we're pursuing for life and satisfaction. May David's example inspire you to seek God and to seek him earnestly, like a deer panting for streams of water. Or you can go the way of Absalom. Listen to verse 9. But those who seek, verse 9, those who seek to destroy my life will go down to the depths of the earth. You see, Absalom was seeking something. You may say, preacher, <laughs> I know I'm a sinner, but I'm not, I'm not trying to kill someone. Why are you identifying me with Absalom? Well, some days I feel like I identify with Absalom, certainly more than David. You see, Absalom's desires were earthbound. <laughs> he 
He wanted a throne. He feared David. He wanted glory. He wanted a certain job. And he would do whatever it would take to get it. Our souls long for things. Maybe it's to be liked. Maybe it's to be loved. Maybe just to be accepted. Maybe to be great. And we can long for these things more than knowing God himself. Romans 1 speaks about how we long for the creator or created things. But may this psalm, let it reorient your hearts as you're hearing the word even now. In your wilderness, in your soul agonizing trials, seek God earnestly. But how? How? We move on to the second way that we can follow David. Again, like David, by meditating on God's steadfast love, but for us, revealed in Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, we got a banquet table, friends. Now, for those of you who are like, preacher, you lost me, man. These ancient words, like, I, mm -mm. Maybe like Samuel's aunt 10 years ago, was it, said, I want to talk to God. I'm, I don't like these things. Okay, I will, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. But for those of you, that what, what, what I'm teaching, it resonates. This will especially be helpful for you. We got a banquet table here. Because what we're learning is that God is saying that the way to satisfy your soul is by thinking about the faithfulness of this covenant partner, thinking about that man or woman married for 50 years, loving his husband or wife through great sickness and trial and hardship. And you look at that and say, wow, what loyalty, what covenant faithfulness. Well, God's covenant faithfulness in scripture is unparalleled. And there are six covenants. Don't worry, I won't camp out on them all for very long. But let me, I don't want to deprive you and famish your soul by talking to you about these great delicacies on the banquet table, but not letting you taste any of them. Why don't we even now do what David was doing? Let's spend some time together meditating and thinking about God's steadfast love. I'm going to say something about covenants, though. In the Bible, you know, there's God. <laughs> he's the superior covenant partner, but he has people he, he's in covenant with. The first covenant with creation is with creation through Adam. This is a covenant relationship. We know that because in Hosea, Hosea says, Adam transgressed the covenant. You see that a covenant relationship, and the stipulations were clear. This was a relationship based on promise and responsibility. And Adam and Eve would be, to go, be God's uh, vice regents who would extend his rule throughout the world in servant-hearted ways that reflected his love and care, both for the world and for all the people in it. They were to image God. <laughs> extend the Garden of Eden as far as the east is from the west so that all people could know and enjoy the presence of God and his good rule. But there was a sign, a symbol, one way that they would express their submission to his lordship, one way to express their loyalty. They were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day that they eat of that tree, they would die. And what we read in the scriptures is that Adam became disloyal. He was disloyal. He took from the tree. I know there's more to the story, but I got to move fast here. I know there's Satan. I know there's Eve. But in Romans 5, we read that sin and death came to the world through one man. That man, Adam, God came to him. He was disloyal. And as God promised, because he always keeps his word, sin and death entered the world. You see, God was keeping his word, but he made a provisional promise. He didn't decide to destroy the world at that time. He promised that a son would come from Eve who would crush the serpent and reverse this curse of sin and death that has spread all over the world. 
And what we find is we find in the next covenant with Noah, it's a reaffirmation. The same sort of thing is happening. Adam has three sons. Noah has three sons. Adam was a gardener. Noah's a vine dresser. Adam's story ends in shameful nakedness. So does Noah's. But Noah walks out of the ark with his family into a whole new world, reminiscent of what Adam and Eve had, because God has it in his heart to redeem humanity and to make a whole new world. He's not chucking his plan. He's committed to his plan. He's committed to his promises. And that's the covenant with Noah and all of the creation. And there's a rainbow in the sky. And it's a reminder that God will never judge the world this way again. And he hasn't, has he? We haven't seen a worldwide flood since. But here's the way that God's going to bless the world and bring salvation to everyone. It's through a man named Abraham. And God made a, entered into covenant with Abraham. Now, God demands that the covenant partner be faithful. Adam wasn't faithful. Noah wasn't faithful. Do you think Abraham will be the faithful one? Through whom all God's promises will come to pass? Well, he lied about his sister. He wasn't the ultimate answer. But you know what's interesting is in the formal covenant ceremony. Do you like wedding ceremonies? Samuel, I saw you help lead one when uh, our brother Elisha got married here in Serbia. I like weddings in Serbia. Well, can you imagine if Elisha was sleeping when entering into covenant with his wife? That's what happened. Abraham was sleeping when he entered into covenant with God. In Genesis 15, God walks through that the dead animals. It was a a ceremony where basically both partners in the covenant would say, hey, I'm going to keep my promises and I'm going to be faithful to my word. And if I'm not, I will die like these animals. But for those of you who know the Bible, only God walks through. Abraham doesn't. And what that means is that God is swearing and promising to keep both sides of the covenant. God's going to be faithful. And even if Abraham's not, God will die for it. And David, when he would read that passage, David would be thinking, how can an eternal God die? That sounds impossible. He didn't have the New Testament to read from. You have the cheat sheet. You have the cheat notes. David's thinking about this stuff. Somehow God is going to keep his word. And you know the story of Abraham with Isaac in Genesis 22, when God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son? Does that sound like an odd story to you? You know the point of that story? You read it closely. It's at that point in Abraham's life when he demonstrates utmost loyalty to God, even willing to sacrifice his own son. And it's at that moment where God says, okay, I promise to bless the world through you. Because that's the kind of covenant faithfulness that God demands to bless the world. But it wasn't found in Adam. It wasn't found in Noah. It wasn't found in Abraham. It wouldn't be found in Israel. It certainly wasn't found in David. So when you get to the end of the Old Testament, you know what you should be thinking? Unless God himself comes down, this plan's never going to come to pass. Because God keeps keeping his word. He promised sin and death if they sinned, so he did. But he's promised salvation. And even if man keeps failing, he himself will come down and die. And that's exactly what has happened, my friends. This is the pathway to joy. For those of you who are with me, this is it. In your wilderness, in your difficulties, the thing that will satisfy your soul is not more pleasant circumstances that might make life a little easier for a while, and that will be good. It's not wrong to pray about these things, but that is not what will satisfy your soul. Whoops. Jesus Christ he is God's son. He has come down. He died on the cross for our sins. God has died in the person of his son. He is God. He is man. He is the incarnation of covenant faithfulness seen in Jesus Christ. The covenant faithfulness God wanted in Adam and wanted in Noah and wanted in Abraham and wanted in Israel and wanted in David. You see it in Jesus. There's the answer. So here's the question. As hard as your life may be right now, things might not be going the way you want, but here is the thing that David does when things aren't going the way that he would like. But here's the question. What has God promised and has he been faithful? He has promised me a savior. He's been faithful. 
He's promised my, the forgiveness of my sins. I have that. He's promised cleansing. I have that. God's washed me white as snow. He's promised me a new world. That's coming. That's coming one day. And all the circumstances will be better in time. And for us, with Jesus, he's promised the Spirit. Has God given you the Spirit? Do you believe? Has he been faithful? Romans 8, the Spirit prays for you in your weakness. God is working all things for your good. Romans 8, 29, namely that you would be more conformed into the image of your Son. Are you more godly now than when you first believed? That means God has been faithful. He's been faithful to you. He's never left you. He's never forsaken you. He's proven his love for you in the cross. This is what it means to seek God earnestly, to set your mind to think on these things, to chew on God's covenant faithfulness to you in the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, who rose from the dead, who went to heaven, who sent the Spirit, and who will return and you will see him face to face and rejoice in a new world with all the redeemed and there will be no more psalms like this there. Oh no, you will be fully satisfied there. No more, no one trying to kill you anymore. No more tears there. No more sorrow. This is what it looks like to seek God earnestly, to think on these things. God's steadfast love is better than life. And now for those of you I come back who you don't believe these things. <laughs> I get it. I didn't always believe it either. But I come back to the question then. What is it that you're longing for if not the author of life himself? Do you honestly believe that those other things that you're longing for are really going to satisfy you in an everlasting way. I beg you to reconsider and consider the wisdom of Scripture and the words of Jesus as we lead into this final point. Here is the third thing to believe, that God will satisfy you. That's the promise. You can be confident that God will satisfy you. Listen to what Jesus says in John 7, 37. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus said, this is for you. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You will embrace Jesus and his words, or you reject Jesus. I like doctors who tell me the truth. I like dentists who tell me the truth, even if it hurts, okay? I want to know the truth, so I have to tell you where this psalm goes. If you don't seek to be satisfied in God, there are two destinies here in this psalm. Just like Psalm 1, two destinies. Verse 11 says that the king shall rejoice in God. And all who swear by him. <laughs> oh, how true that is of King Jesus, the ultimate king of Israel, the greater David. All who swear by him and trust in him will rejoice in him forever. But the mouths of liars will be stopped. There's any of you who say, no, it's not true. God is not. Jesus is not the wellspring of life. He does not satisfy the soul. Your mouth will be stopped on judgment day. You will be with those who are given over to the power of the sword. That means judgment. Jesus was very clear on the doctrine of heaven and hell in the New Testament. But I hope the thing that would woo you to God is the very joy 
and covenant faithfulness, the joy that you could have in knowing the love of God in Jesus Christ. A few practical tips for those of you who want to meditate on God's steadfast love. You might be thinking, hey, yeah, that's why we need to read the Bible every day. I say yes, but be careful. In John 5, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they study the scriptures every day. But Jesus said, these are the scriptures that bear witness about me, but you refuse to come to me to have life. So yeah, it is my practice as well to be in the word daily. But the word is meant to take us to Jesus, to know the love of Jesus, to see Jesus, to find joy in Jesus, not to read the Bible like the Pharisees who studied the scriptures, but it didn't take them to Jesus. So that's a word of caution and encouragement. Yes, read your Bible, but may it Read it in a way that it would take you to Jesus. Secondly, on prayer, notice David seeks God earnestly. Prayer is hard. You know, like uh, I may have shared this before, but it reminds me of chewing gum. I like chewing gum. But meditation is the opposite because usually with chewing bubble gum, you start chewing it, it's great at first, but then soon it loses its flavor and you throw it out. Meditation works the opposite way. You start to chew, but oftentimes it takes, and like prayer and meditation, it takes a while before you will enjoy and find the, 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 the delight that you can have in God. God rewards those who seek him. We have microwaves and McDonald's. We like things fast. We like high-speed internet. God is not high-speed internet. <laughs> He's a person, and he wants us to linger on his covenant faithfulness and to persevere in prayer as we think about these things, and you will be satisfied. I could go on, but let me close with these words. Psalm 63 is a lamp for our feet. It is an example of how to seek God and find joy in him. And may God help us this week to use it and to think about these things so that like David, we would be people this week in our wilderness, people who seek God earnestly and people who set our minds to think about his covenant keeping love so that we will be satisfied this week in our wilderness, not after all the circumstances are hopefully better. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that by your spirit you would help us to long for you and your son more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.